Welcome back, Year 5. In today's reading lesson, we're going to be looking at two different texts. The first one is called The Incredible Centipede, and it's a poem. I'll be using that one to model the learning intention for you. The second text is called The Emperor's New Nose, and that's the one you will be using for your independent work. But what are we doing? Well, today we are going to quote evidence from a text to support an answer. To do this, we will need to use speech marks or quotation marks correctly. So we're going to be taking words directly from the text to support our answers. Let's take a look at that by first reading The Incredible Centipede. Both of today's texts are taken from the book of silly stories that I have. On the screen, you can now see the authors and the illustrators of these stories. So let's have a read and then we'll consider some questions that we can use quotations from the passage to answer. The Incredible Centipede. I'm not just an ordinary centipede. I live in a circus van. The top performers are known to me and I have a wonderful plan. We'll reach a town and as the sun goes down, the folks will crowd the tent. With music to thrill, they'll pick up the bill and read with astonishment. Star of the show in the ring tonight, and we hope he does succeed, is the enterprising, most surprising, incredible centipede. The curtains will part and out I'll dart and shake a leg or six. Then in spangled tights, I'll scale the heights to perform my amazing tricks. I'll swing from the wire with a toehold catch and fold my legs like the clown. I'll pedal the bike with the balancing pole, but I'll ride it upside down. I'll fly through the air without a net. They'll be standing on their seats. The crowds will roar. They'll be calling for more of my incredible feats. It will be so grand in every land. Royalty will want to be seen, meeting the incredible centipede. And I'll shake hands with kings and queens. So this was just a silly little poem about a centipede that looks a little too big for me to be happy with him. I don't know. He seems like about six, seven feet tall, and I don't like that. But it's fake. It's fiction. <laughs> and he is a performer in a circus, it seems, and he does all kinds of tricks. We're going to be taking a look at two questions about this poem. And to answer those questions, we're going to have to quote from the text. But first, let's see how we go about quoting from a text. When you quote from a text, you're not using your own words when you put those quotation marks in. So the quotation marks signal to whoever is reading your work that these are not your words, you've taken them directly from somewhere else. So when we're going to quote from a text, we always do two things. The first thing is we cite the text evidence. This means that you're showing where you're getting the information from. You can do this by saying, according to the text, the author stated, based on the text, the text mentioned that, in the second paragraph it stated that, on page blank the text stated, an example from the text is, and so on. All of these ways of starting your sentence or your answer show that the information you're about to give is not directly from your mind, it's taken straight from somewhere else. You then follow this citation, that's what that's called when you say according to the text or something like that, it's called a citation you follow up your citation with quotation marks and you fill those quotation marks with the part of the text that you want to use to answer the question. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that now. All right, so here's the first question. How is the incredible centipede described and what does this suggest about him? All right, so I'm looking to describe the centipede, but I can use a quotation from the text to answer this. So I've decided after looking through the poem that I want to use the third stanza. I want to use some information from the third stanza for my answer. So here you can see that third stanza and I've underlined the information that I want to use. The enterprising, most surprising, incredible centipede. I think that does a pretty good job of describing him. So now let me work this into my answer. First, I need a citation to show that I'm taking the information from somewhere else. So I'll say According to stanza three, and then I put my comma because that's my introductory phrase, he is, and now here come my quotation marks, because now this is where I'm lifting words directly from the text. The enterprising, most surprising, incredible centipede, end quotation mark, because those are the only words I lifted from the text. Everything else is my own words. I followed up my quotation with this. This suggests that he is an amazing performer that the audience will love. So 
I've answered the question, how is he described, and also what does this suggest about him? The key takeaways here is that I started with a citation according to stanza three, and then when I spoke directly from the text or I took words directly from the text, I used quotation marks around those words. Anything that wasn't taken directly from the text was not inside those quotation marks. Let's look at another example. All right, so this question asks, what are three tricks the incredible centipede will perform? All right, so I've looked through the poem and I found that lots of his tricks are described in stanzas four and five. So I'm gonna take my information from there. In red, you can see where I underline the bits that I want to use in my answer. So let me start. I said, in the poem, it mentions that he will swing from the wire with a toehold catch, fold his legs like a clown, and fly through the air without a net. Again, I started with my citation. In the poem, it mentions that he will. There, I made it clear that I'm about to say something that is not my specific words. I'm referring to the poem. Then, the words that I took directly from the text, I put in quotation marks. But you might notice I have a lot more quotation marks this time. Well, that's because I took three pieces of evidence because it asked for three tricks. These didn't all appear in the same line or as part of the same sentence. So I quoted them separately. Swing from the wire with a toehold catch. That was the first thing. And then I put a comma because I'm listing things. So I had to close my quotation marks and put my comma. Then I listed the next thing. Fold his legs like a clown. Ended the quotation, put my comma because now I'm at the last thing in my list. And fly through the air without a net. End my quotation mark again because that was the third thing. So I only put quotation marks around words that I take directly from the text. Something else you're going to notice kind of interesting here is that when I said fold his legs like a clown, do you see how I put his in those little brackets? Take a look at where I took that line from. In the poem it says, and fold my legs like a clown. But would it make sense if I wrote fold my legs like a clown in my answer? This is what it would say if I did that. In the poem, it mentions that he will swing from the wire with a toehold catch, fold my legs like a clown. Wait a minute, is he gonna come out of the poem and run up to me and fold my legs? No. For my answer to make sense, I had to change the word my to his because I'm talking about the incredible centipede. When you have to change something in a quote that you're making and you need to like take out a word and replace it with something else, you put the replacement word in brackets just like that. That way, when somebody's reading it, they know, oh, it didn't look like that in the original text, but you changed it just so, so it would make sense for your answer. All right, now that we've seen how to quote from a text to give an answer, let's read the text that will be used for your independent work. And then you're gonna see the questions you have to answer yourself. The Emperor's Mew Knows. Uh the emperor spluttered and wheezed into his enormous white handkerchief as he blew his sore and throbbing nose for the umpteenth time that day. To say that the emperor had a cold would be the understatement of the year. This was the cold to beat all colds. An all coughing, all sneezing, all spluttering, and all wheezing type of cold. A real throat aching, eye watering, bone shaking head rattler. Get the picture? Well, needless to say, the emperor was fed up. And he wasn't the only one. After all, he was the emperor. He wasn't going to suffer in silence. Oh no. He called all his statesmen and courtiers to gather into his stateroom, where he was languishing on a daybed, propped up on a mountain of pillows, clutching a hot water bottle, and sipping a large drink of hot lemon and honey. To his left was a footman fanning him with an enormous feather fan. To his right was another, busy mopping his sweating brow. The rest of the assembly was required to groan sympathetically as each cough or sneeze shook his aching bones. They had been standing there for three days now, and frankly it was getting rather tedious. Not to mention the fact that several of them had started snuffling rather alarmingly themselves. As a monstrously loud sneeze shook his large overfed frame, the emperor used yet another giant handkerchief and tossed it into an overflowing bin. I give anything for a new nose. He snuffled. The crowd groaned on cue with as much sympathy as they could muster. 
but the court jester, who was worn to a frazzle with his attempts to entertain the ailing emperor, pricked up his ears at once. A new nose? What a marvelous idea! Why ever didn't I think of it myself? And you'd really give anything for a new nose? The court jester said, smiling slyly. Anything, wheezed the emperor. If only it were possible. Anything is possible, your majesty, smiled the court jester mysteriously, bowing low. Now it just so happened that the court jester had had his eye on the emperor's fair daughter, Bella, for quite some time. She was rather taken with him, too. She liked his sense of humor. There was just one problem. Emperors didn't like their daughters marrying jesters. It wasn't good for the image, having a son-in-law that people laughed at. But... As the emperor had given his word in front of his entire court to grant any wish, the jester knew he would find it hard to wriggle out of his commitment. So, sensing the opportunity to claim Bella as his bride, he set to work at once to transform the emperor's sickly nose. Taking out his bag of tricks, his book of spells, and his magic wand, the court jester rubbed his chin thoughtfully. As far as court jesters go, he was a pretty good all-rounder. He had a repertoire of jokes for all occasions, was a master of silly walks, an expert at juggling, fire eating, and tightrope walking, a dab hand at card tricks, and not too bad at magic. But not too good either, as the emperor was about to find out. After several minutes spent looking through his book of spells, the court jester came upon just the thing. Transformation of body parts. Difficulty rating, four star. Not for the inexperienced or faint-hearted. Well, it was a bit too difficult, but a lot was at stake, and without further ado, he decided to give it a go. Word soon spread amongst the courtiers of the impending transformation spell. This should liven things up a bit. An excited hush fell on the room as the jester set up sparkly purple curtains around the emperor. The jester paced up and down, muttering under his breath. He was deciding on the exact wording of the spell and practicing until he was word perfect. Then, he picked up his wand, tapped it on his spell book, and asked for silence as he recited the magic words. Abracadabra snuffles and wheezes, away with this nose with its splutters and sneezes. Something grand and imposing appear in its place, a noble nose fit for a true leader's face. With that, he waved his wand in the air, making a trail of sparkling stars. Behind the screen, there was a bright green flash of light, and the audience let out a great gasp as the court jester pulled back the curtains to reveal the emperor with his new nose in all its glory. It was certainly grand, certainly imposing, and quite likely fit for a noble leader, so long as he was leading a herd of elephants. For there, right in the middle of the emperor's startled and alarmed face, was none other than an elephant's long, twisty trunk. Well, what a commotion broke out. At first, the courtiers were stunned into silence. Then there was a great hullabaloo, since, not knowing whether to laugh or cry, they bombarded the secretly astonished and horrified court jester with questions. I say secretly because, although his magic was not up to much, he was ever the professional and was not about to let on for one moment that this was anything other than he had intended. He was also well aware that emperors are notoriously easy to fool and luckily for him, this one was no exception. "'Your Majesty!' he exclaimed, bowing low. "'I am delighted to report a complete success. "'What a noble and distinctive nose! "'What an exceptionally unique profile! "'Doesn't he look marvelous? The court jester turned to the courtiers, who, anxious not to offend the emperor, all loudly declared their approval. "'And what's more,' the jester continued, no sneezes, you will see. The emperor looked at him doubtfully, entirely unsure of the proper reaction, and gave a tentative sniff. <laughs> a rush of clear air filled his lungs. Still, the emperor looked unconvinced, and so the court jester quickly pointed out the many uses and advantages of his magnificent trunk. And the emperor, who above all else was really determined not to look a fool, decided that the best course of action was to pretend to everyone that he was utterly delighted. You are a genius, court jester, and may have anything you wish for, proclaims the emperor. 
By the time he had finished extolling the many virtues of his new nose, he even had himself convinced. Of course, the court jester wasted no time in claiming the fair Bella's hand, and the wedding was arranged to take place at once. Bella was summoned from her bedchamber, where she had rushed to change into her wedding dress and veil as soon as the court jester had started his spell. The emperor looked on with resignation as his beloved daughter became the jester's blushing bride. And blushing she was. You may now kiss the bride, declared the minister. The court jester eagerly lifted Bella's veil, closed his eyes, puckered up, and planted a big sloppy kiss on her rough, wrinkled, and rather hairy trunk. Well, like father, like daughter, I guess. Oh, and as for the elephant, he never did figure out what happened to his trunk or why he was left with the most terrible c c c c c cold a choo And that takes us to the end of the Emperor's new nose. So it seems that the spell the jester did had an effect on the Emperor's children. So when he married his daughter, the daughter already had a trunk, just like her dad. And it's kind of funny too, if you look at the top of the picture, you can see that the nose seemed to be swapped out with an elephant. So the king got an elephant's nose and the elephant got his nose, so the poor little elephant got a cold. All right, time for us to take a look at the questions. Remember, the purpose today is to use quotes from a text to answer a question. So we're lifting information directly from the text. All right, so here are your instructions. You are to answer the following questions by quoting from the text. Don't forget to use quotation marks around words that are taken directly from the text. I should not see quotation marks around your whole answer, just around the words you lift from the text. So as a little reminder, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, you should start by citing evidence. You could say, according to the text, or on page two, or in the first paragraph, it said, and then you put your quotation marks around the words that were said in the text. Here are the questions. I'll give them to you one at a time with the page on the screen that you will need. Number one, how is the emperor's cold described? I've given you a little snip of page one from the story. Your answer is somewhere in there. Question two, what was it like in the emperor's stateroom when he was ill? I've given you the entire second page to search for your answer. You can take bits from different parts of this page to support your answer to what it was like inside of his room. Finally, question three, why was the jester able to get away with giving the king an elephant nose? I've taken a little snip from the second to last page and your answer is somewhere in there. So you'll have to search for it and of course quote it. Please remember to cite your evidence before you put a quotation. So I should see a citation, then your quotation marks. All right, your five, make sure you use your neatest handwriting, set up your book well, put the date, topic, everything, and then when you're done, take a picture of it and email it to me. Make sure you're also going on IXL English and going on RAS Kids. I've noticed that some of you aren't going on RAS Kids as much as you used to. In fact, some of you haven't read a book on RAS Kids in a very long time, and I know exactly who you are. So this week, I'm looking to see who's going to read the most books on RAS Kids. All right, year five, stay safe, and I'll see you soon.